Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Frederick Bertley. I'm the president and CEO of COSI, the number one science museum in the nation, according to USA Today for 2020. Um, what an amazing day and program we have today. We are introducing and launching our Color of Science live edition. This is bringing you a monthly superstar sharing their amazing story and letting you, the viewer listener, ask any questions you may have. It's part of the COSI Connects Live, our digital portal to a universe of amazing programming, free content on our website. So definitely go to COSI.org and go to COSI Connects and you can get that um, repertoire of content. And this is the Color of Science program, which is really a fantastic program all about ensuring people understand that scientists are all around us and they come in every gender, all colors, et cetera. I now have to share my screen as I get ready to kick off this program. So today's Color of Science program, again, the launch of our monthly series showcasing an amazing person of color, an amazing talent that's contributed so much through their life, through their research, through their experience to make our lives better. And today is a conversation with none other than the great Dr. Catherine Sullivan, an incredible um, person, which I'll get to in a minute. Quickly, some housekeeping. I wanna say thank you to our funders, um, especially um, uh, the, the lead funder, the Curtis T and Beverly Cheeks Jewel Family Foundation. Um, Curtis, thank you and Beverly for, for being that lead funder. Shout out to Honda and KeyBank, um, as well as the support from the Garvey Institute to actually um, create this program. I also want to especially thank Vanessa Bowers, the manager of special programs, um, who oversees the Color of Science program and ensures that we execute it flawlessly year in, year out. Jordan Radar, our senior manager of COSI Connects Live. He's the person that's actually technically responsible for today's show and the rest of the COSI team. I also want to thank the Steam Factory at OSU. They're huge supporters for this program. And then finally, a little quick shout out to a young 10-year-old named Joshua Carter, um, who's a budding astrophotographer. I know you're listening and I know you want to hear a lot um, from Dr. Sullivan. So with that, um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Catherine Sullivan. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about one of the most famous women in the world. And lest you think I'm exaggerating, she is the only person out of 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet that has gone to the heavens, as it were, in space as an astronaut and dove to the deepest depth of the ocean. One out of 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet, that makes her pretty special. But she didn't just stop there. She is an incredible author. She's an incredible teacher. She actually was the CEO and executive director of NOAA, which oversees all of our climate and oceanic sciences. And of course, she was the president and CEO of your beloved COSI. With that, it is my pleasure to share her with you, her incredible story. Gotta tell you, she has three, not one, not two, but three Guinness Book World Records, one being the first American woman to walk in space, two being the first woman, and I believe astronaut to have the longest time walking in space, and three to being the person who dove at the deepest depths of the ocean. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Sullivan, AKA astronaut of the century. <laughs> I love the way you give me that, that elevated billing, Frederick, I'll take it. <laughs> Great to be with you. What a, what a great crowd you've gathered here. Well, look, I thought I would share a couple of stories about some of these adventures. Um, as you said, I just recently received three Guinness World Records, and I'm just going to amend the record a little bit, uh, Frederick. Uh, one of them boils down to being the most vertical person in the world to have flown on a space shuttle with the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, three, 334 nautical miles above the Earth and then to have descended to almost 36,000 feet at the Challenger Deep in the Pacific Ocean. The second is the first person to both fly in space and reach the deepest point in the ocean. And the third one is first woman to dive to the Challenger Deep. So uh, I'm kind of tickled that two of them are not, you know, first woman as in, oh yeah, of course a guy did that, but now you came along. They're just plain first person ever. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of people nowadays say things like, it, with respect to role models, you commonly hear people say, if I can't see it, I can't be it. Which sort of implies if I can't see someone who looks like me do something, that means I can't do it. 
Uh, and if there's one thing I've learned through life, it's that seeing someone who's like you do something first may help you down the road because it sort of boosts your confidence a bit. Someone like me did it. I can see myself in that. But the statement can't be completely true because no human being would ever have done anything for the first time if you're always waiting around to see someone else. So if you get that kind of a role model, somebody who helps you see what you could be, go with it. It's a wonderful blessing to have. Uh, don't let yourself believe you have to have it or you can't move. Um, you, you, you can move all on your own lots of more times than you might think. Love that uh, message. Yeah, well, maybe let's get Jordan to flip back to, uh, to this, the adventure slides. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about, but a little bit about the space adventure, a little more about the deep sea adventure because it's so so recent and so, you know, so distinctive. Mm -hmm. uh, when I my dive to the Challenger Deep made me the eighth person ever to go to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. Uh, you know. 12, 12 men walked on the moon. That, so fewer people had been to the bottom of the deep sea than on the moon at the time I dove. But three weeks later, that number had crept just over the number who'd walked on the moon. So there have now been 13 people, men and women, mm -hmm. uh, see the Challenger Deep and 12 men on the moon. It's still pretty small numbers. So you got those pictures there ready to go? So these are the two, uh, uh, I see a little bit in the chat that some people can't see the screen, um, but we'll leave that to Jordan to fix. So these are the two really cool exotic machines that let me do these, these great adventures. And you know, I, I commonly liken them to magic school bus, you know, a, a contraption that lets you go someplace that you otherwise can't really go to. But there, of course, there's nothing magic about either one of these. These are the result of deep scientific and engineering knowledge, practical skills, and vision. So on the right, you see a fantastic picture. I didn't take it. Uh, it's a space shuttle on approach to the International Space Station, just perfectly positioned above the sunlit limb of the Earth. So the, the nose of that space shuttle is, topping, is touching, or looks like it's touching, uh, the top of the layer of the atmosphere that we live in, that orange band is our bit of the atmosphere called the troposphere. And above it is uh, basically the stratosphere. Uh, cool, really super cool shot. And on the left is the submersible limiting factor uh, conceived of, imagined, envisioned uh, by one individual, I'll tell you a bit about him, uh, and paid for by that same individual because there was no government or other public program to explore the deepest parts of the ocean. And this gentleman decided we ought to have access to any part of the ocean on our own planet for crying out loud. So I'll tell you a bit about that. Let's flip to the next one, please. So this is me uh, in 1984, that's me on the left. This is aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger, my first flight. Dave Liesma is the guy with the red band on his space suit. Uh, and we were out in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle Challenger for about, about three and a half hours, which is actually short as spacewalks go. Uh, but any spacewalk is a good spacewalk. And as you can see here, we're at the very far back end of the cargo bay of the shuttle. Uh, maybe you can make that run one more time, Frederick. Uh, our experiment, the experiment that needed us to go outside, uh, was that package at the very back with the American flag on it. So that was our main job. What I'm doing here is crossing from the left side to the right side of the space shuttle uh, because I had to go do a small repair up here in what's basically the lower left hand corner. Um, you can see the earth going by, the shuttle's flying kind of left wing down. We don't feel any of that, of course. We can put our bodies any which way we want, but this gives you a sense of the scale of the view, uh, the clarity, the majesty. I mean, it, flying in space, floating in microgravity, um, the view and the, and the floating in microgravity are two of the coolest, best, most fun things that uh, they'll, they'll put a smile on your face all the time. Go on to the next one. There you go. Uh, and as, as I said, spectacular vistas. Uh, we took this one on my second flight, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope flight. And uh, you're looking at the Grand Banks of the Bahamas. Uh, so you're looking kind of northeast. You see the bright, turquoise blue, that, those are the shallow water banks of the Bahama Islands. You see one big sort of 
thumb-shaped island at the left. And you see that deep blue tongue that sticks in among all the bright teal, bright turquoise. That's called the tongue of the ocean. Uh, and the sandbanks plummet off to thousands of feet depth right there. And that's actually where the Gulf Stream current begins. Caribbean and uh, Western Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico waters all sort of converge there and you know, plunge down into that tongue of the ocean and, and become the root of the Gulf Stream, as it were. But look at the curvature of the Earth. Look how far you're seeing. Uh, you look out the window of a space shuttle or a space station, and you, you can basically see about a thousand miles uh, in any direction. So this is the kind of vista you get in the daytime. On the next shot, see the kind of vista you can get at night. We've hopped over to North Africa and we're looking northward. So that what looks like that brightly lit flower with the long stem, that's the Nile River. Uh, and the, the flower at the top is the Nile Delta itself, the bright, very bright spot at the bottom of the flower is the Egypt's capital city of Cairo. And then if you move to the right of the Nile River, you see strings of light uh, that uh, line up along one arm of the Red Sea. That's the Gulf of Suez. You see a, a snake of lights that marks the Suez Canal itself. Further to the right, you see another band of light that moves almost parallel to the edge of the picture. And that's the other arm of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, which becomes a big fault zone, kind of like a San Andreas fault zone. And if you move up along that fault zone, you're seeing the bright lights of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and Haifa. You're actually seeing at the far distance all the way up into Syria and Southern Turkey and Greece and Cyprus uh, and way off to the left near the upper edge of the earth. You're, you're probably seeing all the way over to, I would guess Rome uh, is that last bright light. So you're looking at the Mediterranean, that's the blue bit in between. The other thing I'll point out to you is that thin yellow band above uh, the edge of the Earth. Uh, that's called the air glow uh, band. And it's basically the same physics that are happening there that happen that we know as the northern and southern lights. Uh, but the, the physics are not so intense uh, at the mid latitudes as they are near the poles. So you get this very diffuse yellowish band all around the Earth and it's there day or night. We just can only see it on the night side just as we can only see the aurora on the dark side. So let's flip on ahead again. So this is the individual I mentioned to you. This is Victor Vescovo. Uh, Victor was raised in Texas. He kind of, he's a, a very serious, intense student uh, growing up, loved math and numbers. He's a real math whiz. Uh, he did an undergraduate degree in, um, in geopolitics and economics, and then later did a, a master's degree at MIT in basically quantitative economics. He served in the US Navy as an intelligence officer for a while. So he speaks Arabic and a number of uh, more exotic Eastern European languages than, than I speak. Um, and then he went into investment banking and that's, uh, that's where he's made uh, his fortune. He's also quite an adventurer. So for about 20 years, he was a very serious mountaineer. He climbed the highest mountain on every one of the seven continents that he completed the seven summits challenge. And then he skied cross country skied across both the North and South poles. And if you do those nine things together, you are said to have completed the explorers grand slam. And while he was doing those things, he began to think, well, wait a minute, you know, there's this thing in life called symmetry and a planet has high points and has low points. And everyone talks about the seven summits challenge. How come I've never heard anyone talk about the, the however many deeps challenge? And then and he just started asking more questions. So you know, he had this little glimmer of curiosity. Why don't you ever hear about going to the deeps? And instead of letting it drop, he kept scratching at it. And first he discovered, well, how many deeps does that mean? And the answer is basically five. We talk about the seven seas, but there are five oceans. And then he started asking, well, why hasn't this ever been done? And he discovered, well, reason number one is the deep parts are in these long arcing trenches, which I'll show you in a moment. And we know where the trenches are, but they're a thousand, two thousand miles long. And we don't, in most cases, we don't know where the actual deepest point in that thousand mile arc is. We know more about the topography of the moon than we know about the topography of the deepest parts of our ocean. So that shocked him. And then the other reason no one had done it is because there wasn't any kind of inner space vehicle that could take anybody there. 
And so Victor set out, again, asking, well, couldn't there be, instead of saying, oh, well, there isn't, he said, well, couldn't there be? Uh, and let's go on from here with the next picture. Uh, here's what he's, so he went to a group, a company that's renowned for producing deep, deep, deep diving submersibles called Triton submarines. But when they say deep, deep, they've usually meant six or 8,000 feet, not 36,000 feet. And so he said, well, is that because you can't do 36,000 feet or you just haven't done it yet? And they started the engineering, they started the design. The result was this small craft you see on the, on the right. It's about, it looks kind of like a giant pillow. It's about 15 feet left to right and maybe 12 feet top to bottom and maybe six feet thick. Uh, and inside uh, the business portion, which I'll show you, is a, a titanium sphere. That's what you need to put the humans in if you're going to go that deep. Uh, submersibles are good at going straight up and down. They're not good at moving around very far underwater. So if you're going to go all around the planet, getting to the deepest part in every ocean, you need a ship to carry the submersible. And you also need a ship that can carry the kind of sonar system that can map the seafloor and confirm for you where is that deepest point. So you see on the left, the ship that Victor uh, bought it actually used to be a NOAA ship. I signed the paperwork that disposed of it from NOAA and put it on the market. So where Victor ended up buying it. It used to be a Navy submarine hunter uh, and it was fitted pretty, pretty well, pretty well um, designed to house and host a small submersible and a sonar. So again, this is, Victor was the person who had this vision uh, all of the, this is basically a private yacht that you see on the left, he owns this vessel and it's a private submersible you see on the right. The next slide. So where are these deep places? Um, and this is an odd view of the ocean. Uh, you're looking straight down on the continent of Antarctica and Frederick, I don't know if you have an active cursor, but if you do, maybe, yeah, maybe show folks where Antarctica is, right? It's right in the middle of, come up, come, yep, right, up, nope, left, slow down, left, that, left, 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 come up, come up, left. Okay, Australia is the black bit to the right of your cursor, and Antarctica is the black bit immediately to your left. There you go. And then you can recognize Africa. It, it's hard to recognize the geography of the land masses, the way this is flattened out, but all the black bits are land. The brown, think of the brown as the muddy, muddy plain that you would have if you drained 20,000 feet of the ocean out. So the upper 6,000 meters, which is basically 20,000 feet, you've drained it out. What used to be covered with water at that depth is just mud. And the blue bits that you see, those long skinny blue bits everywhere, those are the deep trenches that I was talking about. And this is where Victor set out to dive in the Arctic, so it's the Arctic, the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian, and the Southern Oceans. Uh, and, and that's what he set out to go do. Uh, the next slide, I'll give you a sense of when we say deep, what do we mean deep, and where was I going? So on the left is a more conventional map. You see Japan and China and you know, places you can find in your, on your globe or in your atlas. Uh, the Marianas Trench is indicated in the black letters. It's that big curving blue bit there and Challenger Deep where that is is shown in red letters. And on the right, I'll give you a sense of the scale of how deep the Challenger Deep is. So the Marianas Trench, its deepest point is Challenger Deep. That's how deep it would be. And go to the right there, you'll notice if you, if you could put Mount Everest into the bottom of the Marianas Trench, you would still have a mile worth of water above the crest of Mount Everest. The, the trench is a mile deeper than uh, Everest is high. And the next time any of us are in a commercial jetliner flying you know, across the Atlantic Ocean or across the, the continent of the United States, um, on a long flight like that, commonly your airplane will be cruising at 35,000 feet. And the Challenger deep is about, about 1,000 feet deeper than that. Uh, so it, it is seriously deep. Uh, and that's, that's where we were going. Now, how did I get to go here? I mean, Victor, Victor set out in 2019 with the ship he owned and the submersible he owned to do what he had dreamt of, to go to the deepest point in, in each of the five big oceans, starting with go find the deepest point. And he completed that. 
the Five Deeps Expedition, and he was uh, awarded a Guinness World Record. He's the first human being to both stand on the top of the highest point on Earth, Mount Everest, and go to the deepest point on the planet, uh, and the first one to go to all of the five deep points. Uh, he decided to go back and do more scientific work with the submersible and the ship in 2020, and to raise awareness of his campaign and of the oceans by inviting notable, interesting people along. And he decided that for the Challenger Deep, it was time that a woman, preferably a female scientist, uh, get to dive to the Challenger Deep in person. And apparently he asked around uh, to colleagues and friends in the marine world who, you know, who, who should that be if I invite someone, a woman to come along? And uh, my name kept popping up. So out of the blue, I got an email inviting me to join him on this expedition. Uh, it was not, not a hard decision, I'll just tell you that. Um, let's go to the next slide. And this is gonna be another little video clip, Frederick, which might need a mouse click to start. Um, this, this is, I'm in the submersible uh, at this point. We've just been released from the surface ship. Uh, that little tow line connects us to a Zodiac. And the guy on the top of the sub, his job is to disconnect all the lines and remove those silver railings and make sure there's nothing dangling around on the sub that could get tangled on something on the bottom. It's the kind of the most fun, but also the hardest job on the expedition is to be the swimmer. He has to do the same thing in reverse when we surface, by the way, and it, it is like riding a bucking bronco. So let's go to the next one. Here we are on the way down. Um, you can see we're basically wearing you know, street clothes. I mean, the flight suit equivalent is street clothes for a, a little bit of warmth. And because that fabric doesn't produce any static electricity, you don't want stray electricity around these, uh, all these electronics. You see the electrical control panel all lit up behind us there. Uh, yeah, and it, you know, it's cozy. Um, the trip to the bottom in this submersible takes four hours. And I would liken it to four hours in, a, in an economy class airline seat. Uh, the seat back does not recline, but there's also no one in front of you who's gonna drop their seat back into your lap. Um, and it's um, you know, not as crowded as three abreast where you're bumping shoulders with the guy next to you. There was, you know, Victor and I, you can see are not bumping up against each other. And there was some room for our feet. You could move around and shift your weight a little bit um, and, and avoid getting uh, too very stiff. So here we are on our way down, a four hour elevator ride. We check in with the surface every 15 minutes by under, by uh, through the water acoustics so that they know everything's good and what depth we're at. The next slide. Uh, now we're on the bottom. Uh, we, we landed a, a, about a kilometer away from this location and flew over to this little device that you see out the window with the label SCAF on it. In addition to the submersible going to the bottom, for every dive, we put three of these uh, robotic instrument packages on the bottom. They serve as navigation beacon, beacons and also uh, captured other scientific samples. So what we were doing on our dives was trying to make measurements that would improve the topographic maps. So, and rendezvousing with each of these navigation beacons was one way we did that. So this is just a, this is a cell phone picture that I took out the starboard viewport uh, where I was sitting. Uh, so you know, 35,800 and some odd feet. Now we were going to leave this point and fly to the next one of these nav beacons, but we had had some electrical system alarms, uh, cautions go off on the way down. And in a submersible, if you start getting electrical system um, error messages, it kind of tells you that seawater is managing to sneak into places that it's not supposed to be. And sure enough, bits of seawater were sneaking into some of the electronics boxes. And long story short, um, that ended up draining, <clears throat> draining one of the many batteries on the submersible. It ran out of use right about after I took this picture. And as an abundance of caution and good safety, if that particular battery ever ran all the way out of juice, the weight that was holding you on the bottom would release automatically and you would start back up on your way to the surface. So instead of four hours on the bottom, uh, we spent about an hour and a half on the bottom. By the way, that big metallic thing in the right hand portion of the viewport is a manipulator arm. Uh, we had hoped we would get near the steep wall of the trench and find some loose rocks 
that we could grab with the manipulator and bring back to the surface. That would have been my job. I had done some training uh, with this exact manipulator and its control system. It's sort of a, it, it's sort of a prime, a, a number one and number two. So I, you drive it with the miniature version of the arm inside the submersible and whatever you do with the small arm is amplified and transmitted to the big arm outside. But because we did never get over to the wall of the trench, I didn't get to fly the arm. Uh, next slide. And here's what it looked like flying along the flat sediment covered bottom of the Marianas Trench. You see how sort of, it looks pebbly. Those are not really pebbles. All those little bumps are places where some critter is living in the sediment, usually worms or small crustaceans called amphipods. Uh, some of the bigger tra transparent things you see lying on the surface are a variety of sea cucumber. If you've ever gone snorkeling in the Caribbean or the tropics, you've probably seen cucumbers. These are distant cousins adapted to living in this super deep place. But it looked like a moonscape, except all of this novelty bit told me as an oceanographer, this is what I would call a, a very, a, an, an active bottom, uh, a very, a living bottom. There's stuff going, biological stuff going on here. Uh, one of the later dives, there were three dives were done on our expedition. We can flip ahead one more. Thanks, Frederick. Um, the third of our dives, uh, managed to get all four hours on the bottom and did get over to the steeper edge of the trench wall, uh, which is, remember, this is a place where one chunk of the Earth's crust is, is being pushed and plunging below another chunk. The Pacific plate is diving under the Asia plate. So this is a really high energy active zone. And you can see how blocky the rocks are. These are big chunks of basalt that are being broken up and, and jumbled around. Uh, where these two plates are colliding together. And on the right, you see some orange or yellow uh, encrustation like on that rock there. Um, the, the water right here is, we believe, very, very cold. No evidence that there's any hot water seeping through. But those orange bits are uh, chemosynthetic bacteria. So that's active living bacteria that does not depend on sunlight, but is um, staying alive. It's producing its food energy from the chemicals in the rock and in the surrounding seawater. Uh, we know chemosynthetic bacteria from places like Yellowstone Hot Springs uh, and also from the deep sea hot water vents in the Pacific, but this is a kind of a, an unexpected place to see this kind of bacteria. The next slide, I think I've got a clip of the one little guy we met. Excuse me for a second. We have puppy problems here. <laughs> This is Murphy. He decided to table surf while I was busy. Hi. Uh, so this is that same lander I showed you before named Scaff on a different dive. And when Scaff got to the bottom, you'll see this little white thing coming up. This is a little polychaete is the biological term. Bristle worm uh, is a more colloquial term. Uh, I imagine this guy was sleeping peacefully in the upper sediment and Scaff almost landed on him and woke him up. And he had the good grace to just swim right up through our camera. If you notice real carefully, you see a yellow thing inside. That's actually his intestines and his stomach. So these guys are often translucent. They're albino or translucent. It doesn't make sense energetically to produce pigment when you're living in the dark at these depths. Uh, he moves by undulating his entire body like a nudibranch would do. And those fibrous things uh, flailing around probably are feeding tentacles. The, the little things flailing around are not what's making him swim. Uh, it's his whole body undulating that's making him swim. Uh, but that's the only guy we got close enough to to get a good photo shot. I think we have one more. There, there we are. There I am when we got back to the surface. Uh, happy and that we made it. Next one. Uh, these are the certificates that uh, Frederick was mentioning and that I talked about at the uh, at the start of the presentation. Um, the one on the left is basically the most vertical. Nope, the one on the left is first person to fly in space and dive to the bottom of the deep sea. The one on the right is first woman to the Challenger deep. And the one in the middle is the one I call most vertical person in the world. <laughs> Next slide. And you know, there are lots of compare and contrasts to flying in space and going deep. You know, getting off the planet in a rocket amounts to riding a bomb. It's intense, it's explosive, it's eight minutes. 
uh, going to the deep sea, as I mentioned, is you know four hour elevator ride. Um, you can see a thousand miles out of spacecraft window. If you've got really powerful lights, maybe you can see 30 feet outside a submersible. Uh, there's zero air pressure outside your spacecraft. It's the vacuum of space. And the water pressure outside your submersible is 1,100 times the atmospheric pressure. It's 16,000 pounds a square inch. It's two tons. It's sorry, four tons per square inch, eight tons per square inch. So think, think large hippopotamus standing on a single stiletto heel <laughs> and put one of those on every square inch. The thing that's in common is these are both endeavors that take, they take individual vision, they take individual excellence, they take a lot of individual discipline and commitment, but they also take these kind of groups that you see here. Uh, no one does any of these things alone. You have to be able to work in a team uh, you, and, and you don't pick these teams based on who likes or loves each other. You pick these teams on the kind of people and expertise that you need. And part of the challenge is put aside the question of whether you get along perfectly well with everyone. Uh, you guys are the right pieces to make this jigsaw puzzle. So go make the jigsaw puzzle work. But I got to tell you, for all the uh, diligence and study and hard work that every person in both of these pictures has put in, uh, there is no better place to be than on a team like this when your space shuttle has just landed or you've just completed three dives to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. One other little factoid to help you appreciate the magnitude of what Victor Vescovo has done in creating this ship and this submersible. The first time anybody went to the bottom of the Challenger Deep was 1960. It's a Navy Lieutenant named John, John Don Walsh and a Swiss engineer named Jacques Picard in a, in a vehicle called Trieste. And Trieste was damaged on that dive and never dove so deep again. The next time anybody went to the bottom of the Challenger Deep was 52 years later, filmmaker Jim Cameron, 53 years in, in 2013, solo dive in a single person sub that he commissioned and built. And it was also damaged so much it never dove again. So dive number one to dive number two took 52 years. We were at sea, this is our expedition on the right, we were at sea for 10 days and we put two people on the bottom of the Challenger Deep three times in the space of seven days. Wow. So number one to number two takes 52 years. Three, you know, five, six, seven take just seven days. That's the kind of revolutionary scale that Victor has brought to access to the deep sea. And Frederick, I think that's the last one. Yes, fair, I'll stop sharing. So Dr. Sullivan, uh, you know, as always, you never disappoint. Um, just unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to the color of science. This is our diversity and inclusion program showcasing that women and persons of color contribute immensely to science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and it's my pleasure to have the astronaut, Dr. Kathy Sullivan, share that incredible um, um, story with us. We have a lot of questions from kiddos and I know Dr. Sullivan, you love to answer the questions for kiddos. Um, before I get to those, just a few questions from me. The first question I have to ask, and I wanna kind of uh, play off of where you just ended showcasing your shuttle crew and then your challenge deep, you know, the sea crew. Um, I gotta ask, which do you prefer? Now I know you love them both and for different reasons, but if you, considering you've now done both of them, gone up into space and gone to the deepest depths of the ocean, if you had to pick one experience knowing what you know now, what would you choose? So the way I think about that is, you know, what, when someone offers me my next fill in the blank, mm -hmm. you know, go back to space or go uh, down deep. Um, and if I really could only pick one, mm -hmm. I have to say I'd pick go back to space. Uh, the, that, that expansive view, sort of the sense of the planet as a whole and the joys of, my, of zero gravity, um, I'd happily have another dose of that. You know, John Glenn got to go fly again when he was in his 70s, just uh, as a good citizen and as a guinea pig for some studies of uh, how space affects older people. Mm -hmm. Well, so we have one data point on how space affects an old man. And I, my theory is now we need an old broad. And I think I'm front of that line. And I wouldn't <laughs> mind if, if it involved going to the moon. 
Well, I guarantee you every one of the kiddos on this line will sign that letter um, to persuade uh, NASA to, to actually pick you. I think you're, you're spot on with that. That is but not that you're old, but you're definitely need to be the first woman to, to do that advice. Um, listen, so so, so um, we want to get to the questions and there are a lot of questions about space and deep sea, but it's not often that um, I have the pleasure of speaking to someone who's gone up in space and seen that perspective of planet Earth. And then of course, dove down deep into the ocean. And of course, on top of that, you were the head of NOAA. So, so I really want to ask a very simple question, a question about something that's very important to all of us on the planet, climate change. You know, how is climate change impacting the oceans? We don't hear that talk too much. Yeah, we, the ocean is far too left out of most conversations about climate. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons that I would cite. One is in terms of really understanding climate change and developing the scientific capability to make you know, forecasts, better forecasts of what's coming at us when. You can't do that unless you have a lot of data from the ocean because climate, climate what the climate system is uh, in earth sciences, uh, the climate system is the interaction of the sun, the atmosphere and the ocean. That's what produces climate. Long-term trends in moisture and temperature like you know, longer than two weeks. If you're talking today and tomorrow, you're talking weather. If you're talking longer than two weeks or a month, you're talking climate. It's the longer term patterns of that stuff. And it's the sun, the atmosphere and the ocean. But on the planet, it's mainly the ocean that drives that. So we've got to be sure we're taking the right amount of data on the ocean and about the ocean if we're going to have the kind of forecast, you know, predictive capability that can help us get ready. The other thing that's important. So you know, the planet, as the planet gets warmer, liquids expand. So the ocean is actually physically expanding a bit. That's a fairly small effect. Um, it's helping to absorb about half of the excess carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere because the ocean is a big carbon pump. So it's been helping us. It's been protecting us in a sense uh, from the excess CO2. It's going to run out of the room to do that. It will absorb so much CO2 at some point, it can't absorb anymore. Here's the thing that is most commonly forgotten and most, I think, worrisome to me and should be to all of us. You put more CO2 in the ocean, you make the water slightly more acidic. How does the food chain of the ocean work? And it goes from little organisms up to bigger and bigger organisms, right? The, the bulk of the little organisms make small shells out of calcium carbonate, like seashells, but miniature. And that stuff will dissolve if the water gets too acidic. So making the ocean more acidic by shoving more carbon dioxide into it risks making it a weak acid soup that we might not notice when we go swimming at the seashore. But the critters that are, you know, they're, they're the grass in the meadow that everything else in the ocean feeds off of. Uh, they, they might die out because they can't make their shells. That's incredible. So, so listen, so you're in the space shuttle, you have that view that just a few people have of our dear planet Earth. With that perspective in particular, what would you say about what the public really needs to understand about climate change and why should we care about climate change? From again, the perspective of the astronaut looking down at our beautiful blue planet. I would say, you know, you need to, um, what you should understand is that you need to be thinking like an astronaut and you need to be looking after and maintaining your life support system. And that is the ocean and the atmosphere. So the ocean, every other breath you take, that oxygen came from the ocean, from the living organisms in the ocean. There is no form of life anywhere on this planet that is disconnected from the ocean. And there's really not, nowhere anywhere on this planet that's disconnected from everywhere else. Um, if you pick up like that little critter that you saw swimming uh, up through the camera in our video, uh, if you manage to catch that guy and bring him up to the surface and study him scientifically, odds are you would find microplastics in his gut. Mariana's Trench is hundreds of miles from any little speck of land, and it's the deepest place in the ocean. If there's anywhere you might think couldn't possibly show any sign of the hand of man, couldn't possibly have any connection to you sitting here in Columbus, Ohio, it does. 
That is absolutely unbelievable. Well, listen, you heard it here first from one out of 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet, literally the only person who can claim expertise from space to the bottom of the depth. Climate change is important and every little thing we do matters on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. This is Color of Science, our first edition in our digital series, which appears monthly, brought to you by COSI Connects Live. We're listening to Dr. Catherine Sullivan, lead astronaut, amazing person, three times Guinness Book World Record holder, and just really a dear friend of COSI, as she was the president and CEO of this fine institution. With that, we're gonna jump right to the questions from the kiddos. I'm gonna start with some that were sent in early, and then we'll go to the chat. So the first one for you is coming from Isabella, age 10. She asked, what did it feel like to walk in space and how does it feel like to be a world record holder? Isabella, age 10. Hey, Isabella, great questions. Um, you know, when you're doing a spacewalk around the space shuttle or the space station, you actually aren't ever using your feet, not to move around. You move around with your hands. Um, and what it feels like is you get in a swimming pool sometime and hold your breath, uh, hold something a little heavy so that you, you stay below the surface a little bit. But notice how easily you can move around if you go underwater in a swimming pool. That's how easily you can move around any direction, any orientation you want. Um, I'm tickled pink to have some Guinness World Records. It's, uh, it also, I, you know, I wasn't angling for and lobbying for the submarine dive. It, it came to me. I had no idea how Guinness World Records work and I was never thinking about that. It was actually Victor Vescovo when we finished our dive. Um, the topic came up as we were talking over dinner one night, someone else uh, who was going on diving raised it. Uh, and Victor said, well, yeah, Kathy will undoubtedly get a, a world record for being the first woman. I said, uh, yeah, like I have no idea how that works. He said, oh, I know how it works. I'll introduce you. So it's quite fun. I mean, it's a, it's a good giggle. It's, um, I, the, the, I, it's headlines or news releases or certificates have never been the reason I did something. They've been the side effect of things I've been curious to do or motivated to do. Well, well terrific. I, I, I know your fans need to know that you're fluent in French. You love languages and you're fluent in French. And so you'll appreciate Louis Pasteur, one of the best famous Frenchmen, doctor, scientist. He used to say that chance favors the prepared mind. So while you may have think you were lucky, you were absolutely good and you gotta be good to be lucky. And that's why that submarine um, um, opportunity came to you. Another question from Vera, age six. She's asking, what planets did you see up in the sky when you were out there? And what fish did you see in the ocean? I know you talked about the one critter, but share a little more. Yeah, so good question, Vera. You know, we, we really don't go very far away from Earth with the space shuttle or the space station. So we can, we can take some cameras and telescopes with us and we don't have clouds or things to bother us if we wanna look at the moon or Mars, but we're not really closer to them in any meaningful degree. So they pretty well look to us like they would look to you from the earth or you know, like, well, Hubble is a huge big telescope. We never carried anything as big as Hubble. Um, so, you know, we're not really, we're still really, really super close in the earth environment, not, not near anything else. Um, you know, we didn't see any fish on this dive because we left all our lights off as we were going up and down to save our power for being on the bottom. Uh, but the coolest um, mammal, the sea creature I've seen when I've been scuba diving uh, is a whale shark. And they're just, they're almost, they seem to be almost submarine size. They swim at a huge speed without looking like they're moving any of their fins at all. Uh, and they're, they're filter feeders. They're um, they're herbivores, they're grazers, they're, they're not going to eat you, they don't want, come anywhere near wanting you. Um, so they're shaped kind of like a shark, but they're the size of a whale, and they're very mysterious, and their life habitat's very poorly known, but they're spectacular to see and to scuba dive with. Fantastic. Um, Stephanie C. asks you, do you ever plan to go to the moon, and what's your favorite space food? Yeah, well, like I said, if I get the John Glenn deal when I get another couple of years older, um, I will have my fingers crossed that it might involve going to the moon. Um, my favorite space food? Oh, let me think. Um, my favorite space drink, these are all powdered drinks that we rehydrate, uh, was the orange mango drink. We would, we would fight a bit over orange mango. <laughs> uh, I would say my favorite space food, you're not going to believe this answer, 
my favorite space food was goldfish uh, goldfish crackers because you can make them school in zero gravity. <laughs> that was I know you have some video footage of that someday. You need to share with us when you come back. That's really or, cool. or clouds of M and M's. Those are fun too. Really cool. Really cool. Love that. Heather Heather O asks, "What was the most exciting part of your journey, either the space journey or oceanic journey, uh, and what was the scariest?" Um. You know, the most exciting part of the space flight is usually everything between when it starts and when it ends. But the most intense energetic bits are, the, the most intense part is the eight and a half minutes or so that, that you're blasting off the planet. Uh, the next most intense part is the sort of 40, 45 minutes of returning to the earth. Uh, so you're, you're, you inject an awful lot of energy to get off the planet and you have to dissipate or lose all that energy to get back, but you do it over a somewhat longer period of time. Um, this, you know, I mean, I was never like, ah, scared, you know, it's a horror movie scared, because um, I, I know how these things work and I'm part of the crew that's making it work. I'm not a passive observer. Uh, your most anxious times uh, in space flight are, you know, launch uh, and reentry. If you do a spacewalk, spacewalk's actually the hardest and riskiest thing you're getting into your very own single person body shaped spaceship and you are the pilot in command of that spaceship. So that will have your full attention. And you know, the, the thing you're very attentive to in a submersible uh, is that the hatch seals correctly and then you just pay attention to um, the electrical systems and other things to see. If, if you're gonna have to abort the dive, you'll usually have to do it within a thousand feet. Uh, and if it settles in at a thousand feet, that you're, you're gonna be fine. Okay, that, that's great. Um, Joshua J has this um, interesting question. I can't wait to hear your answer. Would you consider setting another world record? That's not the interesting part. Um, but for example, he asks, going from outer space to a deep sea dive in the same mission. Um, you know, there'd have to be some reason other, for me to be interested in doing it, there'd have to be some value other than just getting the world record. I mean, if there were, you know, and some, let's, let's see if we can build, uh, let's see if we can build uh, a vehicle that can, you know, it's the same vehicle. It's not launch a spaceship, land a spaceship, walk across to a ship. Let's see if we could build one craft that could do both, uh, then maybe, or, you know, there's some scientific interest in how quickly can the human body adapt from one to the other, yeah, maybe. But if there were not some purpose like that, it, just for golly gee whiz, no. Well, I, fair enough. I, I will say this, uh, I have not met Joshua, but that kiddo, based on what you've taught us about your colleague, Victor, I, th I think you should suggest that I did a Victor because he might be able to design with you a vehicle that can do exactly what you just said. And that well, would be cool. Well, Vic Victor's actually, Got another challenge in mind. I think it's going to happen early next year, and it's not quite what Joshua said, but it's close. Because if you if you really want to look at you know from Everest is the highest point above sea level, mm -hmm. but if you really want to look at the total topographic elevation, mm -hmm. um, the greatest span would be from the seafloor off Mauna Kea in Hawaii to the summit of Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. That that's the you know biggest vertical extent sort of seafloor yeah. uh, abrupt topography. So he plans to dive in the submersible to the deepest point off the uh, northeast part of the Big Island of Hawaii, mm -hmm. surface in the submersible, shift to a kayak, paddle ashore, and then bicycle part way up and then hike the rest of the way up to the summit of Mauna Kea. Joshua, I know that's not what you asked about, but that's pretty darn cool as well. So. Pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. All right, we're going to jump to, to the chat. And for you chatters, we're going to record your questions. There are so many questions, Dr. Sullivan. Um, so we're just going to have time to pop through a few of them. But I'm just going to pick some here. This is from Angela Brown. And this is about her son. Her son wants to know if space is so cold that can break paper. So I don't know if that's kind of like a liquid nitrogen question. If you hold up a piece of paper in space, would it crumble? Would it crack? Um, in the vacuum of space, probably not. I mean, the, the, the spacewalking astronauts wear uh, checklists, not single sheets of paper, but they, they don't crack. And in orbit around the Earth, you're going, you know, half your time you're bathed by the sun and half your time you're in the shadow of the Earth. So when you're on the sunlit side of the Earth, 
everything is trying to heat up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And as soon as you go into the shadow, all that heat starts to leak away and everything starts to cool down towards minus 250. So you're, you're flipping from pizza oven hot to Antarctic cold every 45 minutes. Wow. wow. So, so that means nothing really gets deeply cold soaked. Uh, if, you were, if you were riding along on a Mars probe mm -hmm. and getting further and further away from the sun, uh, and if you were on the side of the probe facing away from the sun, that would get seriously cold. Okay. Well, fair. All right. So, so Alicia Pugh asks, how did you feel in the depth of the ocean? The deeper you go, the more pressure there is. Did you feel that pressure when you were down there? Yeah, great question, Alicia. And, and, and the answer is no. If I had felt that I would not be here talking to you. Uh, because it, it would, you know, kill us well shout well, you wouldn't get anywhere near 36,000 feet, but you'd die long before that. So I mentioned the titanium sphere. Victor and I were sitting inside a five foot diameter sphere made of solid titanium. Uh, the wall thickness is about three and a half inches thick. And it takes that kind of thick wall to keep all the pressure outside. It's the same principle as the spaceship design. Those have to be strong enough. The spaceship has to be strong enough to hold enough air inside to keep you alive uh, and work against the vacuum outside. Uh, and the submersible is the other way around. It has to hold just one atmosphere of pressure inside while there are 1,100 atmospheres outside. Wow. A lot of math to figure all that out to make sure you guys are safe and sound. Yeah, um, here's a question from Rebecca Asmo. What is your favorite part of exploring the ocean and or space? My favorite part of exploring the ocean is all of the life forms. Uh, the, so many, so myriad forms of life, all the spectacular adaptations of life to living in the dark, to living in high pressure, uh, to having bioluminescence, you know, natural light they, they produce themselves to attract prey or communicate with each other at wavelengths we can't see. I mean, the, the life forms in the ocean are just, we, we have barely scratched the surface in terms of knowing about them. Great. All right, time for two more questions. Layla H7, did you, so you talked about life in the ocean. Did you see life, other life in space aside from your colleagues in the space shuttle? Yeah, nope, only, only my fellow astronauts. <laughs> All right, and Baya H6 is reading about women in space, currently in her literature class. Um, I love that she has a literature class at age six. That's awesome. Um, she would like to ask Dr. Sullivan, how long did you spend in space? You have this great world record. We didn't talk about that. You have this great world record. How long were you actually up there? Oh, I, I have no world records for duration in space. Mm -hmm. it, my flights were um, seven days the first flight, five the second, 10 the third. So, you know, 22 days in space. Uh, you know, I just heard a talk last night by Jessica Meir, a uh, space station astronaut, spent seven months in orbit. Uh, and I did one three and a half hour spacewalk. Uh, she and her, her seven months, they did nine spacewalks in seven months. I think she did three of them. So I'm, I'm completely envious of the people that have, that get that kind of long, length of time to really live, really live in space, not just visit there for a week or 10 days. On the other hand, John Glenn was always really envious of me because you know, when I moved to Columbus, he had had five and a half hours in space on her, his first flight. And he joked that he was, he was jealous of me because by the time I ate lunch on the first day of my first flight, I had more hours in space that he had in his whole life. And now I say sort of the same thing about the space station era people. That's Which fantastic. is good. The program is advancing. It means progress is continuing. Uh, absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, you can tell that Dr. Sullivan is, is unbelievably humble. I mean, with all her accomplishments, she actually can shrug her shoulders and say, well, I was only in space for X amount of days. I mean, just incredible. That, that, those are, there are so many more questions. We're going we're gonna to archive all of those and we'll post some of it on our Color of Science website. I'm going to ask the last question for you. Um, this is the Color of Science program. It's all about ensuring the world understands that all scientists aren't all old men with thick glasses and pocket protectors, but that women make fantastic scientists and engineers, and so do persons of color. As an incredible female scientist, astronaut, you know, Renaissance person, what advice would you give to all kids, but especially girls and persons of color, around the importance of science and technology? 
science and technology, uh, I would say two things. Um, that the way they are taught in school might make you think they are dull and uncreative and just you know, wrote stuff. Uh, that's a misimpression. Being a scientist, being an engineer is nothing like that. It is, they are hugely creative endeavors. You have to be imagining uh, and able to envision and, and create and think of things. So they, they absolutely are creative enterprises. Um, it's super cool and fun to be discovering and creating, to you know, build an answer to a question no one's been able to answer before, build a device. No one had ever built a reusable submersible that could go this deep that often. Engineers, instead of saying, oh, we don't have one, said, whoa, wait, can't we? And you know, that is super cool, fun stuff to do. Um, and the other thing I would say is you live in a technological age and wherever you live on this, really pretty well anywhere on this earth, certainly in the United States, you completely depend on science and technology. Uh, it's in your vitamin pills. It's in, uh, if you don't think you depend on science and technology, tell me where you're picking your food. Uh, it's in supply chain. So whether you end up in your profession or your career in, in the law or in finance or in business, I guarantee you, your satisfaction, your success there will be higher if you have the capacity to understand science and technology principles and practices and modes of reasoning. I can absolutely guarantee you that. That is fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been our absolute pleasure to have this enlightening, awesome conversation with none other than astronaut Dr. Kathy Sullivan, just an incredible story, and her incredible partner, Murphy. <laughs> her incredible partner, Murphy. So good to have you on board. I want to say quickly, there have been so many thank yous and congratulations and all this information in the chat. We'll share that with you so you have that for your records as well. Just thanks so much for being on with us. One last bit of homework. It's going to take about 35 seconds or so. I have to share my screen. For all the kiddos K through 12 participating um, in today's program, hopefully you can see this on my screen. Can you see the Color Science Steam Challenge? Yep, it's up okay, there. Great. So if you participated on this, you can um, participate in this competition. It's the Color Science Steam Challenge. And what you have to do is create your best space or ocean themed art. And this is connecting art with science. We talk about steam, science, technology, engineering, arts and math because we know science and humanities are connected. So if you can create your best space or ocean themed art, anything you wanna do, any medium, do that. First place wins an iPad mini, second place wins a really cool hologram machine, and third place wins our COSI Connects learning lunch boxes, these really cool hands-on kits. All you have to do is create that and to enter, send a photo of what you created. So don't send us your actual creation, please keep that. Send us a photo of what you created of your best space or ocean themed art to vbowers at cosi.org. The deadline is January 1st, and we will pick three winners for first, second, third prize, all inspired by the great Dr. Kathy Sullivan, former CEO of COSI, incredible astronaut, incredible record, world record holder. Um, again, to pull out your phones, snap this screen, vbowers at cosi.org, submit it. Dr. Sullivan, thank you for launching the Color of Science um, Distant distant learning, digital um, platform here with us today. Really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure, Frederick. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Great. Uh, good luck, good Great. luck in your next endeavors. I know we will see that fourth record coming soon. Thanks so much. Uh, Take care. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks, everyone.